Okay, good afternoon, everybody, or good day, or good morning, or whatever time it is for you guys, wherever you are, and welcome to this session on digital opportunities for ambitious islands, how small places can achieve big things. Um, I can see quite a few folk are still coming in on the participants, so we're going to give you a couple more minutes just to get into the session before we introduce our speakers and start talking. Uh, and I'd encourage you all to introduce yourself through the chat, say hi, let us know where you're uh, viewing from. Um, if you have any questions during this session, you can pop them in through uh, the Q&A feature or fire things into the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that as the session goes on. Uh, and the format for the session is we've got five speakers for you today, uh, all going to be speaking about different aspects of digital opportunities for islands. So I'll introduce them in turn um, and then we'll take questions and answers towards the end of the session. Okay, well, it's great to see so many of you here in the session. It's good to see some good interaction happening on the chat already. Um, so I'm going to kick off now by handing over to our first speaker, which is Joe Dignan of Digital Jersey. Go ahead, Joe. So I'm trying to get my screen up. Right, can you see the, uh, the slides? Yeah, good. So I didn't come into um, islands originally. I've been doing smart cities for about 10 years around the world. And then I went to visit to Tortola in the Virgin Isles. And it hit me that basically the perfect place to prove what is possible in the world of smart anything is an island. And I looked for an island that um, I could work with. And I've now ended up as a special advisor to Jersey, uh, which is a small island, 40 miles off France, 120 miles from the UK, 43 square miles, 100,000 people. But what I loved about it was it's like a perfect microcosm of what you could do in, in a region, a city, or an area, or anything else. I'm trying to move the slides on. One of the reasons for that is they control everything. Um, when you're actually working with a city, you're actually banjaxed by the, the four-year election cycle and also the actual diversity of the number of stakeholders you need to get involved. Islands are perfectly placed because they're, they're smaller. Uh, they have exactly the same issues that you may have in a major city. And in Jersey, they own the electricity company, they own the water line, they own the police, they own the, the airport, they own the port. So you can get 20 people in a room and start doing things across the whole island. So they have already put in fiber to every home on the island, including a 15th century castle. So we actually have the basic infrastructure in place of super fast broadband. In fact, it's the third fastest country in the world. It's faster than Singapore, would you believe? And having done this uh, around the world, it it's sometimes gets crippling to try and work out. It seems to be incredibly complicated, incredibly difficult, and how the hell do you do it? So it's quite simple. <laughs> Simple, obviously, a bit of a stretch, but you get the idea. You have to create the right group, and that is an innovation group that actually has lots of different thinking behind it. I used to work for the Future City Catapult in the UK, and we had ethnographers, anthropologists, data scientists, techies, urban designers, and everybody comes at the issue or the wicked problem with a different way of looking at it. If you actually just have IT people, they come at it from an IT perspective. If you have citizen activists, they have to citizen activist play. If it's environmentalists, it's an environmentalist play. You actually need all of those things to get the mix right. And the actual technology piece is the simplest part of what we do. You can do that reasonably easily. The difficult bit is to get people to do things differently. So it's a behavioral change aspect as much as it is around connectivity and, and the way that works. 
And then the third bit is you've got to be able to measure the difference. You've got to be able to, for the business case to stack up or for any investment case to stack up, you have to be able to say, if we do this, we can measure what the difference is going to be. And then you put that back into whatever you're doing. And that is that reinvestment in solving other wicked problems. So the new areas of opportunity and the three that are in there in capital letters are the ones we're doing on Jersey uh, to start with is data exchange and trust models. All around the world, everyone's trying to, everyone's creating masses and masses of data. And they say, we've got loads of data and you want the data to become information, to become insight, which will give you some sort of impact. The problem we have is that there are very, very few data exchange trust models that allow you to share data across different silos. So that's, a, that's something that's not been fixed. There's a couple of organizations such as Ocean Protocol, the Office of Data, um, that are trying to do this, but I've not actually seen it done properly yet. On Jersey, we've created a platform across the whole island based on top of the infrastructure we have. And we're creating the first ever digital twin of a state. So a digital twin is a virtual representation of a physical entity. We already have a 3D model of Jersey and if you do a planning application on Jersey, you have to do it in 3D because it drops straight into the model. But a lot of this activity came out of building information modeling for major infrastructure projects. And what we're doing on Jersey is to try and put some of the soft skills stuff in it as well. Things like independent living, health, circular economy, um, skills to create a gestalt model of the whole island and the way it works which allows you to do scenario planning. If I put a road here, or if I put a school here, or if I do whatever, what would be the result of that in a virtual world gives you an idea what it'd be like in, a, in, a, in the reality. So community platforms, integrated urban planning, smart homes is massively interesting currently. If you think about a home as the, the nexus, the actual bit where a citizen meets a consumer, you can start doing things like channel shift of government services, which obviously takes out the cost. At the same time, you can do things like changing behaviors around energy usage. So you're actually tackling people in terms of both being a citizen and a consumer. And of course, in terms of islands, circular economy is massively important. The kind of idea of taking the waste out of the system, the recycling part of this is absolutely critical. And of course, mobility, when you actually talking about this usually people start talking about parking It's so much bigger than parking in fact mobility and mobility on demand is a very much large part of the circular economy too because you've got so much delivery going on using vans etc so those are the three areas that we are currently working on if you go onto digital jersey's um website you'll see a great deal more i've only got seven minutes to explain what we're trying to do but it's Islands are a wonderful example of showing what is possible in using this sort of technology to create better societies. Thank you. That's absolutely fantastic, Joe. Thanks for that. And you were 50 seconds under time, which is a fantastic precedent for the rest of the panel to, to catch up with. Um, so we're going to keep moving on. If you have any specific questions for Joe, then make sure you fire them into the question and answer function on, on Zoom, and we'll come to those in a moment. Um, our next speaker uh, is Adrian Begley of uh, Aramore Community Council. Um, so Adrian, if I can hand over to you to speak about what you've been doing. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so. Our story here from Aaron Moore is really about um, how we're using connectivity to try and make our community more sustainable. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the project, a bit different to what Joe was talking about there, is a lot of what we do is very much voluntary run. It's a voluntary organisation who are overseeing the project and project managing it. And on top of that also, maybe we are a much smaller community, not 100,000, maybe less than 500 people here. So. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been taken into taking consideration that sometimes we've had to reach out for assistance and get us to where we are. So um, I will see if I can share this. There we go. So just a small sort of overview of where Aaron Moore is. Um, we are 
three miles or five kilometers off the northwest coast of Ireland. Um, pretty remote and windswept. Beautiful place though, where population at the last census was just um, around about 470, but I mean, that sort of goes up and down throughout the years. The seasons change and people come home on holiday and things like that. So we're, we're pretty well ac accessed as well with two uh, car ferries here that run about sort of 10 services throughout the day each. Um, we've got three very good schools. Um, we actually have children now being sent to the island to be educated. They come on the ferries in the morning, leaving in the afternoon. So um, it was quite a good sort of level of education here. We also have a health centre um, and their traditional industries would be fishing and farming, but they have tended to fall off a bit more now than what they used to be because of uh, various different reasons with regards to policies and stuff like that. So um, that in itself has been a bit of an impact on us with regards to employment opportunities. And because of that, we're now very much heavily dependent on tourism. So a lot of our business on the island now would be sort of tourist dependent with, you know, we've got bars and shops and beds and breakfasts and, you know, hotels and things like that. So um, we're, we're very sort of conscious of the fact that we're trying to get people to come here um, to make the place sustainable for the future. So some of the problems that we've been facing as a community, um, you know, and, and the last while back, it's, I mean, sustainability really comes down to it's a numbers game. Um, trying to keep you know uh, a population alive, and when you've got 45% of your population over the age of 65, it becomes a bit sort of problematic, um, especially when you're dealing with things like school numbers, um, or school numbers are starting to drop. Um, in fact, I think it was this June past year, one of our primary schools had no intake of children, and that's the first time in the history, I think, of the school that happened. Um, that's now since changed um, through the summer months there. There was five children actually ended up being enrolled in the schools by September time, which weren't due to be there um, in June previous. So that there was a bit of an upswing throughout the summer as our campaign went on. Um, employment opportunities are an issue as well for us and also, you know, uh, immigration, people moving away looking for work because the opportunities aren't here. And, you know, as well as that, if people who want to be in a position to be able to work remotely, um, broadband was a big thing for us. So it was something we didn't really, we, we had access to Wi-Fi broadband, but it wasn't really reliable um, up until recently. So we thought we'd be building our strengths and the, 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 the Island Council started looking at the things that we had. Um, the Island Council is a voluntary organisation. Um, we've been running now for the last uh, sort of five years. And I mean, as I say, Armour has got a lot of good things going for it. Um, we've got great schools, we've got very good health care. Um, we have a very good, you know, strong community ethos here. I mean, when you've got a sort of population of around about 500 people. Everyone knows everybody else. Everyone looks out for everyone else. So, you know, everybody tends to put their shoulder to the wheel when things need to be done. So, one of our, our, our other big strengths is our diaspora. And, and trying to get our diaspora to think about moving home was important for us. So, we launched a campaign in 2017, January 2017, called Coming Home, to try and encourage our diaspora to think about moving back and the process of doing that, we um, put a survey out to them and asked them what would be the thing that would sort of help them to, to consider you know, the, the relocation more important or more able for them. And the important thing for them was connectivity because a lot of the ones who were in position to move home with young families were people who were remote workers, people who worked in IT and finance and things like that. And connectivity was a big issue for us. Um, if people were going to be coming here to work in you know industries like that, they needed a reliable sort of service which we didn't really have in place. So we were thinking that if we could get that, you know, that would be the starting point of getting people to relocate or maybe even get people who are totally new to Ireland were to come here and maybe think about sort of you know, swelling the population and, you know, and from that, the possibility of uh, employment opportunities coming out of startups and things like that. So um, we thought that the best thing to do would be to have a space where people could work. So a digital shared workspace, digital hub was, was our way forward. It's what we thought would be the thing to have in place for people to think about moving back. Um, and it's it's all very well and good to have you know a, a router in your house and a bit of connection, but you no, know, that's not always reliable. So if you've got a good service and a good space for people, even if they're only five minutes away from the house, they can come in and they can work on a digital space where they feel that they're in an office environment and not necessarily sitting at their kitchen table. Um, that was something that you know people were sort of crying out for. So the council applied for funding um, under the part of the, the town and village and Yule scheme that the Irish government run um, in June that year, and uh, it was 2017, and um, we were awarded, we were successful in the application, we got 100,000 from them, 
100% funded grant. And um, then our local county council added another 25,000 to that. Um, so part of the, of the project was to open a digital hub and connectivity was also an issue for us because what we were able to do then was put in a, a subsea fiber cable to the island because we didn't have one on, on, um, uh, before that. And in, in the process of us um, getting that project underway, word had got around what we were trying to do. In fact, we've been awarded that money. And um, what we were doing then was we were uh, looking at different ways of getting the doors open as quick as possible. Um, Three Ireland, which is a telecommunications company here in Ireland, um, decided they'd get in touch with us and, and asked if they could be part of the project. And they then provided us with wireless lease line into the building where we are now based um, in the digital hub. And that enabled us, it enabled us to, to get the, the, the doors open and the place up operational by April of this year. So it's a two-year partnership, but um, it's been rolled out now in a number of phases because what we've found is, is that, it, you know, the technology solutions that three were putting in place, um, you know, that can be rolled right across the island, not just a, a space here for the digital hub. They wanted to try and make Aaron more, you know, a very well-connected island, and um, they, they rolled it in a number of phases. So the digital hub itself was the, was the first sort of uh, the, the most tangible sort of element, I suppose, of, of, of the project. So you can see it and touch it. Um, but they also put connectivity into local facilities, such as the community centre, the health centre. The local building cooperative, um, all given better connectivity so that they can use um, their services as well as they can anywhere else. So we've got a code of dojo running, for example, in the community centre. Our health centre is now able to run telemedicine. Um, so there's a number of different sort of uh, add-ons to, to, to the project, not just the digital hub, but things that are going to benefit us moving forward. Um, so Part of that partnership with Three also included a, an awful lot of um, PR. Um, Three were able to advertise what they were doing here in Ireland, in, in Ironmore, um, and that obviously went uh, sort of went global, and we got an awful lot of international attention on, on that. Um, so the digital hub itself is, is up and running now. It's been quite successful in the last sort of five six months that it's been running. We've got eleven hot desks. We've got uncontended internet, um, so it's, it's a very reliable sort of service that we have here now, and that which was very important for people who were working in various uh, different IT roles that they were. It was important that they had, you know, good speeds um, and the fact that it was uncontended and it was reliable. Um, we've also got a small breakout room um, for conference calls because we're a partnership also with Cisco WebEx and Samsung have also uh, come on board with us and done a bit of technology partnership with us, giving supply of some equipment. We're in a lovely location, we're right beside the beach. So if anybody ever needs to go outside and get their head showered, they can do that. So it was all very sellable um, sort of things that we had here that we were able to sort of put forward for, um, not just the diaspora who were coming home to use the space, but digital nomads, people who wanted to travel and work at the same time. And we've had quite a number of them over the summer as well. So it's it's been quite successful quite quickly. And it's, it's, it's really sort of taken the, the community on board. The community are, are very much sort of buying into it now on, on the benefits the connectivity are bringing because a lot of people are starting to look at the opportunities that they might have um, in, in their own jobs with or working remote where before they never thought that it was a possibility. Now they're starting to ask their bosses, can I work remote? Or maybe can I spend more time at home? Um, and they're spending more time here now during the summer. They're extending their holidays out. Um, people are spending, like, instead of being one week here during the summer here for maybe three, four weeks, they're spending their Christmas holidays here now before they, before they couldn't. So that feeds into the community on, on a wider um, basis and in, in, in the fact that it assists the businesses and stuff around about because obviously people are spending in the shops and the bars, people are traveling more. Um, so it makes the island more sustainable moving forward. Um, and with that, we need to then look at how, you know, the, the connectivity that we put in place is, is going to work for the wider community. So we've got assisted living packages for the elderly, for example. This has all come through the IoT solutions we've put in place with Three Ireland. Um, the fisheries, we're looking at better fishery management for them, um, using apps, for example, that's going to be able to help them to sort of sell their product better and more traceability for their, their consumers. Um, we've got the telemedicine, as I mentioned, into the health centre now. So it means that our elderly people don't have to travel as much to go to hospitals for consultants. Uh, consultant meetings and things like that but it's also very important for us to make this project work moving forward it's you know that there's more to us you know just having a space for people to come in and, and work in we need to be able to make this connectivity work for the wider sort of sustainability of the island so we need to look at our 
our youth, for example, um, can they maybe access distance learning instead of having to leave the island to go away to third level education? Um, it's quite a distance for them to travel to some universities and stuff, and it's also quite pricey as well. It's just a lot of cost involved. So if they're able to work from home or maybe do their, their, their third level education from home, it, it, it makes a big change for their families. Also, it, it, it assists them in maybe thinking about staying on Ironmore and not having to leave Ironmore, which has always been a major problem for us. So for the whole project being about diaspora and about sustainability and about getting people to move back, if we're able to keep those people here, um, then it, it, it feeds into to more growth for the future, more startups, more people thinking about you know working in Ireland, more, or then again, more business and more employment. Um, so people are also now to, starting to think about retraining. So we've been working with various different organisations, looking at the likes of Imro um, and, and you know the uh, fishing organisation for the islands in Ireland, and how we can use technology to assist them. Um, we've been working with an organisation called Grow Remote to promote um, working remote and, and remote jobs in Ireland, um, and how they might be able to sort of locate jobs for people and, and place people in employment without them having to leave Ironmore. So it's all been very important. I mean, it's, uh, sustainability is, is the big thing. It's been the biggest part of the project for us, and it's starting to work in a very short space of time. Um, we've also been able to sort of capitalize as well on, on the great PR that we've been getting. So it's sort of got a big boost in tourism and things like that too in recent times. Um, but yeah, it's been pretty positive. Um, we're, we're moving forward. We've got that wee bit more to do. It's, the project's never really finished. There's always more to do, um, but we're getting there. Slowly but surely, so hopefully onwards and upwards. But there's one thing I will say is that if you can do this kind of work on an island, you can do it anywhere. So, you know, I think islands have always found themselves to be that wee bit more um, resourceful, that wee bit more innovative. And if, if we can sort of continue to build upon things like that and that type of mindset, then I, th I think there's great things for the future. If islands stay ahead of the curve and lead the way as opposed to being dragged along on the coattails. So thanks very much, folks. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Adrian. That was that was really interesting and a very positive story to hear. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dawn Repetto from Tristan de Cuna, and this is going to be a, a slightly different take on some of the challenges that a lack of digital connectivity can present for an island. So Dawn, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. Good afternoon to everyone, or whatever time it is, wherever you are in the world. Um, I head the tourism department on Tristan de Cunha, and I live on the remotest inhabited island in the world called Tristan de Cunha. It's a few statistics for you. It's 96 square kilometers. Its highest point is 2,060 meters, which is um, Queen Mary's Peak. We have no airport, so for any ships to get to Tristan, it's a seven-day trip. And nearest inhabited settlement is St. Helena, which is 2,400 kilometers away. We have a very small population of about 250 people. We're very community spirited based, very cultural and traditional, and we're a fishing and farming community. We're reliant on the sea to survive, um, whether it be delivering cargo to us from Cape Town, um, fishing for the table, fishing for lobster, which is our main revenue source, and of course, it's the only way to leave Tristan is by sea. We have a very popular welcome sign, um, which depicts the remoteness of our island, and is also a great photo opportunity for visitors. Whenever we have anyone visiting the island, everyone wants to get a photo there. So living remotely brings many challenges, and one of our challenges is weather. Um, we can have very rough seas and harsh winds, which prohibits what we can achieve in a day. You know, it's all dependent on weather here on Tristan. There have been times in the past where we've had a ship bringing cargo and she's had to stay around the island for a week or more before successfully unloading. I mean, this has, can have serious implications because sometimes it leads to um, rations of food supplies. But thankfully, because we grow, we grow and catch a lot of our food, we can survive quite well if cargo is late. Our harbour also is very small, so ships can't dock alongside. Instead, they have to anchor offshore, and cargo and visitors are ferried ashore in small boats. So, you know, that, that can also be um, a disadvantage 
and that's why we need our fees to be nice and calm to get these sort of jobs done. You know, having painted a picture of harsh weather here, um, we can also have flat, calm, tranquil days. And at times like this, you would not wish to be anywhere else but Tristan de Kuna. As head of tourism, when we have visiting cruise ships, it can be a very stressful time. Um, when planning a program for the day, you have to have a plan A and a plan B. Um, there's been cases in the past where seas have been rough on a ship arrival. Um, so to make the best of an opportunity, um, we try and then get islanders on board um, via our search and rescue rib um, to sell handicraft and philatelic material. And also to tell visitors about the island. Um, and normally while this is being done, the ship circumnavigates the island. Sometimes by afternoon, the seas have calm and visitors are able to land, so it's a quick jiggle of the program um, so that we can make sure our visitors have the most unique experience when visiting um, this remote place. We always say if a ship makes the effort to get this far offshore, we'll always make an effort to ensure it's well worth the visit. We also use part-time staff on a cruise ship day. And this is also sometimes a juggle, as these people have full-time jobs so they could be busy in the potato patches, out fishing, um, working um, at PWD, you know, doing electrical work. There's always something to be done. Because Tristan is dictated by the weather, a calm, sunny day means a lot of things can happen. All in all, it's a lot of planning and flexibility is needed um, to ensure we have a good cruise ship day. And we always like to give 110%. Weather is only one of our challenges. Um, communications is also a big challenge on Tristan. We have a very slow internet, and this, you know, impacts on our work. Something that can normally be achieved in maybe five minutes can take half an hour or longer with our slow connectivity. It impacts on our online sales as clients' orders are often delayed. We don't get customers like on the high streets, so we are heavily dependent on online sales, via our website and cruise visitors. You know, it's really important to us that, you know, we have the facility to ensure this is carried out efficiently. We've most certainly progressed. Um, and, and on Tristan, you can't afford to be frustrated. You have to persevere. We still have a long way to go, but we never give up, no matter how frustrating. In July of this year, we had a very severe storm which damaged um, a lot of government buildings and water and electricity was affected for a day. But again, on Tristan, you don't get up, give up, you just have to get on with things. Um, it resulted in Post and Tourism, which is the department I work in, being relocated temporarily. We were also without internet for seven days. And I think many of the islanders felt completely cut off from the outside world. So thank goodness we're now back online and it's given me the opportunity to talk to you all today. Although the storm hit the island hard, we are survivors and we just get on with things. Has, you know, help or assistance of any kind is at least uh, a, a seven-day ship trip away. We also, I also run a small gift shop here. It's called 37 Degrees South. Um, we import some souvenirs, but we also like to focus on handmade items from resources that are available. You know, on Tristan, you can't just walk down to B&Q and pick up what you need. Um, again, it's, it's seven days away, so you need to think ahead, you know, work with what you've got on island. Um, if not, you know, you've got to think ahead to get it ordered in. So we focus on um, the materials we've got readily available. So we hand-knit items, the locals knit hand-knit items made from sheep's wool, um, maybe in the form of a hat scarf, jumpers, love socks. They're all on our website. And we also produce small model longboats, which depicts the, the larger longboats that helped in the early survival of Tristan life. Wooden engraved plaques with um, island logos on them. Knitted penguins. Um, and also, you know, many more, um, many more items. But those are our most popular. Um, we're just days away now from launching a new brand called Tesori di Tommaso, um, which means Thomas Treasures in Italian. 
and it tells the story of an early settler called Thomas Curry and his hidden treasure. The brand has a few different collections from jewellery to Christmas decorations to flax products to bookmarks, all made from, um, you know, try and made from recycled goods that we have ready available. On a remote island dictated by the weather, you have to use resources that you can get to hand. So for more in info on Tristan, you know, please check out our website, www.tristandc.com. Um, we've also got a Facebook page, Tristan the Cleaner, Post and Tourism Direct, or follow us on Twitter. Thank you all for listening. Super, thank you very much, Don. That's lovely to hear. Um, so we're going to move on now to a presentation from David Nichol of NB Communication, talking about how uh, NB have used digital to promote Shetland as a place to live, work, visit, study and invest. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, my name is uh, David Nichol, as Lauren says, and I'm up here in Shetland just now, um, about 180 miles north of mainland Scotland. And yeah, we're going to talk about um, some of the work we do to promote Shetland online using various digital channels and technologies. Now, first, a little bit about uh, me and my company. Um, I run NB Communication. We're a digital marketing agency based in Shetland. Um, we've got uh, strong expertise in marketing destinations and especially islands. Uh, we were founded in 2002 and we now have a team of 20 plus people, many of whom work remotely to us. So we've got designers and developers and other specialists all around Europe. But um, our main offices um, are in Shetland still. Uh, we've got three people in Edinburgh and a base in London too. And our clients are all throughout the UK and far beyond. So uh, because this is an island-focused uh, um, seminar, I thought it would be worthwhile to highlight that we work with various maritime organizations, such as the IMO, the International Maritime Organization. Their uh, new website that we've designed should be going live fairly soon. We've also done work for other bodies in that kind of uh, maritime environmental field, such as OSPAR, Bonn Agreement, and, and many others. We've also got strong experience working for um, harbours and ports um, here in Shetland, in Orkney, in mainland Scotland. And we also have um, uh, a client called Cruise Scotland, who are the industry body to promote cruise tourism in the different ports in Scotland. And that's obviously a very um, big industry growing very fast. We have lots of experience in destination marketing and especially for islands. We do a lot of work in Orkney for Destination Orkney and um, local economic development agencies there. We do all the work on Orkney.com, for example. And we've got many other clients in that field, including Follow the Vikings, which is a, a multinational project um, which ranges across many different countries here in, in Europe, all about the legacy of the Vikings. But the main contract we've got in this field is the Promote Shetland contract which we currently run on behalf of the Shetland Islands Council. Now, this is a very ambitious project. Um, the council here and the community as a whole have um, lots of aspirations to try and ensure that we are a prosperous and very successful community and economy long into the future. So we need more people to come here to live, work, study, visit and invest. And our project um, is currently a four and a half year contract, which we run um, it involves a very wide variety of different channels. So we look after the official website for Shetland. We look after a whole range of social media and uh, press um, activity. We're very engaged with the local community and population and lots of different stakeholders who are involved in this stuff. Hey, you, sorry to interrupt. If you could uh, make sure you're speaking a bit louder. People are struggling to hear you. Okay, no problem. Um, I can go a bit closer. So yeah, we've got a very, very broad um, a range of activities that we take part in as part of this contract. And uh, one of the most interesting things I think that we did in the past year is uh, a campaign around the Opelia festival or festivals. Now, it might be something that many people here have no idea about at all. Um, it's a, a very unique uh, festival, a range of festivals in Shetland during the winter months. And uh, from the photo here, you'll see that there's certainly lots of fire involved. But it's not just that. Um, there's lots of 
people dressed up in different disguises. There's a strong Viking or Norse element to it. The festivals are led by a chief, Geyser, a Geyser Jarl, who's the kind of figurehead for each festival during the day. Uh, lots of visitations and kind of community engagement. And yeah, each of these festivals ends in a, a torchlight procession, which culminates in a beautiful replica longship, Yun Burund, uh, which seems very strange to many people, but it's just all part of the fun. And that's just the start of a long night of partying and uh, just good fun all around. So it's a very, very community focused thing. And there are 12 of these festivals um, between January and March in Shetland every year. So yeah, these images here provide a little flavor of what's involved. It's a very strange kind of thing, I'm sure, to outsiders. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a very fascinating kind of cultural phenomenon, really. And although it's very much um, uh, something organized by the local community for their own enjoyment, we as Promote Shetland saw the opportunity to really push these events um, globally to make people more aware of Shetland. So our campaign in 2019, the main aspirations we had were to make people realize that it's actually a season of events. The, the main Okaya, the biggest one in Lerwick, is reasonably well known within Scotland and, and elsewhere, but there's actually 12 of these festivals. So I think part of our mission was to get people to realize that it was a whole season. And it's also not just these Vikings, it's actually a whole community thing. And we wanted to capture that community spirit and all the, the great community work that goes into organizing these events. And ultimately we wanted to generate interest in Shetland as a whole. So the activities that we, we undertook as part of this campaign, a wide range of things, many different channels. Uh, the Shetland.org website, the official site for the islands, we made sure that we had plenty of content on this site about all the festivals. We gave people plenty of um, information about visiting and attending and taking part and so on. So that was a, quite a major undertaking actually because there's so many of these events. This is augmented by our Okpaya.com website. It's a, just a small site, but it acts as a hub for our activity. So we can um, embed live broadcasts or um, pre-commissioned videos or social media feeds and tweets and images and so on. So it's a really active hub for all the coverage and uh, content that we're creating during these months. And it's been a very successful little site. Obviously, in these days, uh, Video is a, is a very big part of any content marketing um, aspiration and we were very keen to create high quality, professional and uh, really engaging video as much as we could to, uh, to share the inside story of these festivals. And the videos we created last year were very popular, very successful, including the one at the front of this uh, slide, which is a, a kind of an insider's guide to the festival, 15 minute long guide which has proved to be very worthwhile for people who don't know anything about it. So I mean, even in 15 minutes it's hard to explain what this is all about. So I've been trying to do it in half a minute. And it's obviously <laughs> a bit of a challenge. But yeah, you should check that one out. Uh, Facebook has been a very, very powerful uh, channel for us and we've used it for kind of fairly normal things like posting messages and uh, sharing up to date content. But we also made extensive use of the Facebook Live facility, which essentially gives you a, a, a chance to broadcast live to an audience on Facebook. And our team went out and about in Lerwick on Lerwick IAD and used Facebook Live quite extensively. And it was just on mobile phones using 4G, broadcasting to the world, reaching tens of thousands of people instantly. And it's proved to be very successful. And likewise, um, Certainly at nighttime during the Lerwick Festival, which is the biggest of them, we've always uh, sought to cover that as professionally as possible. So we've had essentially a live, um, live broadcast of, of the event, and that's hugely popular. You've got people from all over the world who eagerly look forward to that every year and tune in. Twitter, a slightly different channel to Facebook, and in fact, using this has allowed us to reach a very different audience Twitter tends to be an easier way to reach global media outlets and uh, different people who are not on Facebook. And we've used it very successfully in the past couple of years as well. And likewise, 
Instagram. Um, we don't maybe post so much of our own content there, but the Zip Valley Art Festivals are very photogenic events and many other people are posting images which we can share with our audience. And uh, it's been a very successful recent addition to our um, kind of suite of, of channels that we use. So I can't share all the statistics with you, but we've got a massive different data here. But just some of the, the top level Facebook stats. Um, during our Palaya season, which is January, February, and March, uh, we reached 2.2 million people on Facebook. And that's without any significant spending on advertising or boosting anything. That's just all through sharing and people uh, being very engaged with the content that being seen by more and more people. The, the live broadcast that we did of the Torchlight Procession for the Lyric Festival um, on its own was viewed by 170,000 people. And overall, the IR related videos we created have, well, in that time period, were viewed uh, 750,000, sorry, 750,000 minutes of those videos had been viewed in those three months, but the, those videos continue to be viewed um, even to this day. So that's always continuing to go up. So for a relatively modest investment in, uh, in time and effort here, and well, a fair effort in creating content, I think we've been able to reach quite a, a big audience just using channels that are freely available to, to anybody. Uh, some of the many comments we received, and I'm not gonna read these out, but essentially the, the coverage that we put in place was very successful at encouraging people to to really want to come to Shetland to see these festivals for themselves. And many of the Facebook comments or Twitter messages or whatever were very um, uh, eager and excited. People who had formed an opinion that they definitely want to come and see Shetland for themselves. So we're very happy with, with that result. And we plan to do much the same again this year, maybe a, a slight different take on some of the things, but uh, it's certainly been successful and we plan to do it all again. So some thoughts, I mean, obviously I've spoken very specifically about um, some festivals here in Shetland, which are perhaps a bit unlike anything else that you might have in your islands. But I think that the general point is that there is potentially a large global audience for authentic local events. I think people all around the world are quite fascinated by what goes on in islands and by island life. And I'm sure that many other islands have got really fantastic um, cultural and kind of heritage events that would lend themselves to a very similar type of uh, campaign. And the thing here too about the Palaya is it's certainly not a tourist event, it's not something that is laid on specifically for tourists, but it just happens to appeal to tourists. And I think there is potential for the people in islands to perhaps um, to, to, to use that thinking a bit more. It doesn't have to be stuff that you lay on, especially for visitors that is actually a huge potential for people to be attracted by the stuff that you're doing anyway. One thing about um, Papaya is it really connects with um, ex-Shetlanders who now live elsewhere. And I think it's a big market for us. If we can tap in more to that expat islander market, people who live elsewhere, that's a huge big pool of very um, passionate ambassadors who are keen to, to promote us and promote what we're doing. And I think we've been successful there. And other islands can be um, equally as successful, I believe. Uh, the big challenge for this kind of campaign is to select and use the right digital platforms and channels. And I gave you a very quick tour of some of the channels we use there, but there's a lot of um, thought that has to go into selecting the right ones, using the right content in the right place, not publishing too much, not publishing too little. And as we repeat these campaigns every year, we always get a little bit more um, knowledgeable about what's going to work and what isn't. So that's a big part of the challenge. But I just think overall there is certainly opportunities for other islands to run similar campaigns to what we've done here in Shetland. And uh, there's no reason why we can't all be promoting the stuff we're proud of to a wide global audience in a way that makes people fascinated by the islands that they live in and makes them determined to come and spend some money uh, visiting us or uh, even coming to live and work in the islands where we live. So yeah, I think there's potential there and I'd be delighted to talk to anybody about this kind of stuff. So thank you very much. That's my presentation finished. Thank you, David.
Um, so then I'm going to hand over now to our final speaker of the session, uh, which is Stuart from Kylo to talk about running a digital business in a remote island location. Okay, everybody. So uh, firstly, can you hear me okay? I'm going to say, yep. yep, good. And hopefully now you should be able to see uh, Kylo. Uh, so, um, so I guess, uh, firstly, it's pronounced Kylo. I've had various uh, people come up to me in the past as to, to, to try and uh, pronounce it. I've had Kylie, Chloe. Um, some people think we're associated with uh, Kylie Jenner. It's not the case. Um, in actual fact, uh, Kylo is a cow. Um, it's a Scottish cow, a Highland cow, uh, which are... Uh, um, world renowned um, and uh, cows have nothing to do with digital marketing or islands in general um, but it's the company name that we have uh, and so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, Kylo uh, as, as a business uh, and then go on to um, being based in a, a remote island community up in Orkney. Um, I'm not from Orkney but I would say it's uh, the best island in the world, apologies for that. Um, Orkney is based on the north of Scotland and it's actually, a, it's an archipelago, so it's a collection of islands and there's about 20,000 people up here. Um, a, a pretty diverse economy um, and we have similar challenges to kind of the things that have been uh, discussed in, in, in the past. I only moved up here about uh, uh, back in 2014 um, and, and my life up here has been kind of largely family orientated, but um, started, started the business up here a little while ago, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, so uh, we're a technology company, um, a technology company that, best, that specializes in the staffing and recruiting sector. Um, and it's a sector that an awful lot of people don't really know about that exists. It's, it's about a 50 billion uh, um, Euro industry worldwide, um, operating in a hunt in many different countries, um, and there's there's a specific uh, technology platform within that sector, um, which is called Bullhorn, and they are a uh, software as a service uh, CRM solution, and we are specialists in that uh, in, in in that platform by providing um, consultancy. Um, and our products to augment the functionality um, from, from Orkney. Um, and our business was founded uh, back, in 2000, back in 2015 with the primary focus to help uh, recruitment agencies worldwide um, uh, start to leverage that technology. Um, so that is, we, we implement Bullhorn for our clients and we get them starting to, to use that uh, system so they can find more people, better jobs uh, all around the world. And um, Bullhorn as a, as a technology platform has been around for about 20 years now, and they've got a, a large number of customers all over the world. Um, they're the biggest single provider of technology to that market. Uh, and because of that, there's a large number of customers who need ongoing consultancy. So to, to supplement some of the clients that we work with for the first time, we provide project and consulting services. Um, to staffing organizations and recruiting organizations um, all over the world um, to help them get the most out of their technology, ultimately to try and find people um, uh, jobs. Um, that's kind of what we, what we're, what we do. Uh, and the final thing that we do is we build products. Um, so uh, we have, uh, if I could turn my webcam around, there's a team of developers uh, just uh, sitting in front of me um, and uh, we build products to sell to the staffing and recruiting world uh, from, from Orkney. Um, today, uh, the majority of our work is based on, on, on services, uh, so project work, uh, um, software development, uh, data analysis, training, project management. Um, but strategically, um, we're going to be growing our business by, by selling um, more, more products uh, to the same customer base, ultimately, uh, over the coming years ahead. Um, so we founded the business uh, back in 2015, uh, all the way up in uh, Orkney. And uh, not by choice, it just so happened to be that's where I was at the time. Um, and 
throughout this, throughout our journey, um, I, I guess this, this slide is really here to, to illustrate that over a number of different years, going from 2015 to 2016 and onwards, uh, we've had the support of a number of different organizations to help us uh, along the way. Um, whether that is um, uh, Business Gateway, uh, Orkney Islands Council, uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, um, they, they supported us originally um, to you know, help us buy things like projectors and chairs and, and all sorts. Um, and then uh, support us by, by actually um, uh, covering costs of the initial hires uh, that, that we made to help kind of build some of those products and offer those services. And over the uh, years, they helped us with um, uh, growth internationally. Uh, and so the primary focus of Islands and Islands, which is obviously uh, um, sort of uh, a, a good organization that can help promote uh, businesses internationally, um, they, they kind of helped us kind of explore new markets, uh, helped us go to uh, the US. Um, in, in 2017, um, we sort of decided to double down on, on what we did. And uh, we, we opened a new office and we basically had to put a business plan together to hire another uh, 20 people uh, up in, or, in Orkney. Uh, reason being that we felt pretty strong that there was going to be expansion into new markets and that led us into uh, Australia um, and, and, and Asia as well. And where we want to go in the next couple of years uh, is, by, is right now we have um, a user base of uh, about seven or 8,000 uh, recruiters that use our software on a daily basis. Uh, we want to increase that quite substantially by the end of 2021 to 25,000. And uh, by the end of 2024, uh, we want to have 50,000 people that use our software uh, all around the world. Um, still continuing to be focused on the recruitment software sector, um, but with a, a, a large emphasis on our, on, on our hopefully uh, global customer base. So uh, I'll just quickly kind of uh, build this slide up. The thing I, 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 I want to just call out here is that um, we're all about islands um, and part of our strategic objectives is to uh, hire exclusively in, in islands for, for certain positions. Um, and uh, and we, we've made that strategic choice. And so it's pretty core to our business and we look to kind of continue to do that. And we feel that there's enough opportunity for us to um, uh, employ up to uh, 50 people in Orkney. Um, and so uh, this is kind of where, where we want to get to. And um, I think one of the things to probably keep in mind is that over the past four or four, four years or so, uh, we've encountered a number of challenges by being based in Orkley, but having ultimately a global business. Um, obviously, technology uh, is, is a problem sometimes. Uh, cultural differences between um, people working and, and wanting to have a good work-life balance, uh, all the while trying to provide support to customers based in Australia and the US. Um, and I think probably the, the thing that I'm, 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 I'm personally am most uh, um, pleased about with is, is the impact that we've had on the community by being able to employ people, uh, work with local suppliers as part of that. Um, and I think last, probably about a couple months ago, we did a stat that was um, over the last uh, 12 months, we've contributed um, about £800,000 to the local Orkney economy through working with suppliers um, and just generally uh, em employing people in Kirkwall. So that's Kylo. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, so that brings us to the last of our speakers now. So what I'd like to do is now to sort of start opening up to the questions um, and addressing some of the ones that have come through so far. Um, please do feel free to keep sending questions through in the chat and the question answer, because um, we now have about 30 minutes left of time to chat about things. Um, so we've had a, a range of, of speakers talking about some very different opportunities through digital um, for islands and there have been some there have been some specific questions uh, around it's really lovely to encouraging to see lots of people popping up in the question and answers asking about whether they can work with each other um, using some of these examples that we talked about 
Um, but I'd like to start by opening up a uh, discussion around, um, there's been a question around examples of digital innovation, specifically digital software, um, coming from islands locations um, and what we can do to encourage islands to think digitally in this way. So I don't know if any of our speakers would like to address that question initially. Um, if you do, just unmute and, and on you go. It's Joe here. There's this one that I don't know if anybody's here from Antigua, not Antigua, uh, Anguilla, because they can, they've come up with a brilliant idea. I don't know if anyone's watched the stuff that Estonia had done. So they have an E certificate of residency. So you can start up a business in Estonia without living there. And what Angela did was to look at that and they came up with a brilliant idea. They wanted to move away from some of the tourism stuff they were doing. So they've come up with something called a, a, an IP certificate of residency. And what that means is if you develop a, a software package or basically a software solution, or some kind of intellectual property on the island, it's taxed for the 50 years of the IP at angular rates. The quid pro quo is you have to set up innovation centers on the island. So if you're something like an Amazon or a Google and you want to set up an innovation center where the IP is going to be taxed at rates that you would consider to be good, then that's where you would go to do it. That kind of thinking, I think, is um, it's, it's very good lateral thinking around how do you create different types of jobs in islands, not necessarily just tourism jobs. Thank you, Joe. Does anybody else have any, any thoughts on, um, or any good examples? I mean, we've had some, some good examples already this, this afternoon about islands using digital in, in an innovative ways and establishing themselves as digital centers of innovation. I don't know if anybody has any other examples they'd like to highlight of that kind. Yeah, I, I think that um, I probably, I, I, I know that there are other islands on the west coast of Scotland that have had similar uh, successes. We've, we've obviously with the connections that we have through uh, Highlands and Islands and Enterprise, um, the west coast of Scotland uh, in, in Skye, I think as well, has other companies that are, uh, that are, that are doing ultimately um, really still quite innovative things. And I think that where, um, uh, I think uh, it, there, was a, there was, somebody had a campaign which is coming home, um, which I thought was really cool. And I think that that's, that is, is that kind of, um, uh, thinking and, and initiative by whoever's by whoever's leading the charge on those things that's really going to kick start this kind of thing because I, it's it's the people that are I would say that have experience that have the drive and maybe have young families um, that are going to be the ones that are that are able to kind of really uh, notwithstanding other other people as well uh, but with the, with the support of 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 any kind of businesses or other um, uh, funding out there that's really going to be able to kind of bring that that on, uh, and so I know that there are plenty of other islands in in and around the UK that that have have done that in the past. I I, I do think it really does need support from um, uh, from from either governments or 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 uh, councils in order to break down some of those barriers that are um, really quite high for initial startups. Um, such as providing a place to work or a chair or fast internet. Um, and that investment just has to be made. Thanks. Um, there's been a few kind of things popping up in the chat about um, getting return on investment for connectivity and, and particularly focusing on the, the level of connectivity that places like Faro have achieved. Um, I suppose one question for the speakers would be, how do we as island groups encourage this level of, of connectivity? How can we get, and we had a very good example of three uh, getting involved in the work that Aaron Moore have been doing earlier on, on in the presentation. So how do we get the, the companies who are able to, to help with connectivity, to engage with islands and to see the value in, 
investing in island communities in that way? Well, I can explain maybe from the point of view of, of what we did here in Iron Moor. Um, certainly with regards to three, it, you know, they reached out to us. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't like we went looking for them. Our, our, our initial goal and, and, and remains as is, 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 is that we're, you know, the, the, the plan is for Iron Moor to be having a gold standard of connectivity um, of, of a high speed fibre subsea cable. Um, but with regards to the likes of three reaching out to us, I mean, it, it, three seen a benefit to them um, and the possibility that of, of them being able to sort of showcase what they're able to do. Um, now, it was actually been three are, are a mobile uh, broadband provider and a telecommunications company, but they also have a business element where they would sort of supply connectivity to the businesses and factories and various other things, whether it be in cities and whatnot. And they basically took Iron Moore as, as a single entity, as, as a business, and looked at the various different sort of issues that we, maybe if we were a business, would have. So it, it wasn't just about the hub, that the hub was the, was the most sort of sort of visual element of what we have because it's a large building, it's tangible, it's something you can touch and use. But outside of that, you know, it, they also went to look then at the other sort of issues that we might have as a community with regards to assisted living, for example, you know, um, having an elderly population, we're able to use technology to have them, you know, ha feel a little bit more secure in their home, that people want to remain at home. So they use technology to, to assist with that. and, and using the, the IoT system for that. So, you know, they're very sort of simple solutions, but they, they were able to sort of stretch out, you know, right across the island. And um, the likes of environmental monitoring, which we've got a weather station here <clears throat> on the island, and that's, that's based over by the helipad, which we use for Mediavax. Um, so, you know, the, the likes of the Air Corps when they're coming in to, to do a Mediavac or the RNLI when they're out doing a sea rescue or the fishermen have got real-time data to be able to sort of, you know, see exactly what's going on on the ground and, and they're able to use that to, to their advantage and use that to, to, to make themselves more productive and, and uh, more efficient in, in the service they provide. So it, it, it's, it's about using the way we've seen it in our conversations with three before we started doing what we were doing was to see how we could use technology to, to, to be beneficial to the community right across the board. So it's things that benefit tourism, things that benefit um, the elderly, um, things that benefit education. There's many different sort of things that we could put in place with that, and and, and three were then able to sort of showcase what they then then do for, for themselves. So maybe you know it, it's if you're getting companies that got involved, there has to be some sort of you know a, a symbiotic sort of relationship going on, where both sort of people, both parties are benefiting. Um, we we were lucky in, in so much as that we, we we have a really good relationship with three now, and um. It, it, their staff and everybody who's been involved in the project have very much bought into the whole emotional element of, of, of what the whole island thing is. But I think that's the important thing is, is that islands are very unique places. As Stuart was saying that, you know, with regards to, to the, the coming home uh, project that we were, were running, it was all about our diaspora. It was all about getting people to think about relocating. And I, I think, you know, I, I don't think it's it's sort of difficult for me to say that all islands or all islands diaspora have got a very sort of strong long, longing to be at home as much as they possibly can and that they love where they're from and they're proud of where they're from and we should be capitalizing on that. Um, I, I, I think our, our people are our strength and um, if, if we can use connectivity to sort of get them back, whether it be to, to have innovative startups and, you know, using things like IoT solutions or you know, um, various different sort of IT projects that people come on. We've quite a few people from Iron Moore now have got their own businesses where they're app doing app development and game development and things like that. So it's about getting those people to think about relocating um, because they can be as productive here now on Iron Moore, for example, as it could be in any other city. So it's maybe important to build upon the diaspora and, and, and use them as the, the launch pad because they're the ones with the, the desires and with the answers as far as far as we would be concerned. And there's also, I mean, just building on Adrian's point, I mean, a lot of what I do is bring corporates into this sort of situation. Most of the, I used to work from places like Microsoft and stuff, and what they're looking for is large, large scale demonstration projects where they can prove what their stuff can do. So, for example, we're bringing NVIDIA into um, Jersey to do some sort of edge computing around the cameras and the camera analytics. You've got people like 
I don't know, MasterCard. MasterCard have just signed up a deal with Dublin because MasterCards say they're no longer a, a credit card company, they're a data analytics company and they need data to work with. You've got to actually go to these companies and say, we've got, I mean, this, the Jersey proposition, if you look at it, it's in the, uh, the Jersey, digital Jersey, is they're offering themselves as a living sandbox with a population and a port, an airport, a maritime, et cetera, et cetera, agri-tech, uh, large financial services industry. They're going to build a second only um, autonomous uh, airport control tower in the world. If you offer that to companies, companies I know will come along and say, well, okay, we can, we can co-invest in doing this because we need to prove that this stuff works. That's the, that's the value proposition I think that islands can actually bring in to so say, come here, show that your stuff works. It's a merchandising spot as much as anything else. It may go against some of the grain of some of the, your thinking, but if you want to bring it in, that's what you need to do. And it's also going back to that sort of tourism piece. I, I, I'm Scottish as well. It seems like a lot of Scottish people in here, but we did, uh, I was up in the northeast of Scotland, and our, our best was genealogical tourism. Genealogical tourism was basically, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Canada or Australia, or whatever, coming back to see where great grandpappy grew up. And we loved them because they'd stay about six weeks. They were usually retired. They dropped a lot of money. They stayed in the best hotels. So tourism is not around numbers anymore. It's actually around who spends the most amount of money and stays the longest. And that's where you need some of the sort of data analytics to make this work. So genealogical tourism is massively important for places like Ireland and Scotland, uh, and you know, I'm sure other places too. That's the sort of stuff that works. But actually offering yourself as a, a sandbox can bring in investment from, a, from lots and lots of different places. There's no actual shortage of money for this type of activity. You know, I did a report once, which was looked at the top seven IFIs, international financial institutions in the world, around smart cities, or smart, whatever smart is. And it came back exactly what I thought it would come back as, which is there's only 128 million currently being spent on what they call smart cities, smart regions. But that's because they're using nomenclature, which is 10 years out of date. They're told, still talking about things like e-procurement, e-health, e-transport, anything with an e in front of it is basically digitized services, delivery. Once you move that back in, there's $14 billion currently available for investment around these activities. There's not a problem with the money. There is a problem about getting good ideas together and then also trying to work out what does the return on the investment, what is the business case for making this work? Sorry, I'm getting on my high horse here. So I'll shut up again for a minute, but it's not actually that difficult to do if, <laughs> if you just take it from its simplest idea. There is money there. There's not a lot of good ideas. There are corporates who are willing to invest. Microsoft's got a $9 billion R&D budget. That's just Microsoft. Can you imagine Google, Amazon, all the other corporates, et cetera. And what they wanna do is prove their stuff works. You gotta stick your hand up and say, come to our place and show it works. Okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> That's a fascinating horse you to get on, even if. <laughs> um, so there are just a, a little bit of admin here. If you're sending questions in the Zoom webinar chat, if you could try and send to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see the questions that are coming in, um, because some of our panelists might not be able to answer the questions, but you may find the attendees can um, to do that. Uh, at the bottom of your Zoom webinar chat, just above where you're writing your message, you can see it says two. If you click the drop down box to make sure it selects all panelists and attendees, that means that everybody that's attending can see what you're typing. Um, so we've had quite a lot of questions coming in about blockchain. I don't know if anybody feels confident to talk about blockchain from our panel. Um, but if not, and anybody in the uh, audience wants to talk about it, then there are some questions in the Q&A which you can type answers to as participants. Uh, do we have any volunteers about blockchain? Well, I mean, basically blockchain is a component part of things like digital twins. 
you've got to have some sort of ledger technologies that allows you to say this data is real data, it's good data, and also you need time stamping on it as well. So it's not just blockchain. So I mean, every sort of smart discussion you go into now, you must talk about virtual reality, augmented reality, ledger technologies, and to some extent, sort of digital twinning and IoT systems. That basically is the whole piece. Can I just say one last thing before, before I go on to that other bit? Was, is everyone aware that there's a cities challenge out from the EU currently? And for the first time ever, it actually has smart islands as a theme. So there is a, a cities challenge with a big wajadosh behind it. And for the first time ever, it actually has smart islands as a theme. So I can send the, uh, the link through to James or whomsoever, and you can distribute it to everybody out there. But that's the kind of activity of going to find the cash. Because without the cash, you can't really do anything. It's always, I mean, when I actually have a lot of these speaking events, people keep saying, it's this sort of smart activity, it's all about people, it's all about people. This is the sort of citizen, citizen activist part of it. And then you get the technologists saying it's all about connectivity and infrastructure. And in fact, it's not a binary question. Unless you have the connectivity and infrastructure, you can't do the smart stuff that you want to do as a citizen activist. But to do that, you need the money. So you gotta go and find the funding that allows you to have the physical infrastructure before you can start to do the citizen activists, things like independent living for Alzheimer patients, all that kind of stuff that sits on top of it. It's like a little bit of a <laughs> uh, For anyone that's interested in blockchain, there is a, a kind of thread occurring in the Q&A section now where people are talking about um, some good examples of the use of that. Uh, we're still getting a few things coming through just to panelists so i'll maybe try and copy some of the links or james if you could maybe try and copy some of the links i think folk are maybe struggling to get the all panelists and attendees option um just share some of that stuff that's coming through um some of the earlier questions that came in weren't specifically about digital connectivity and the di use of digital um tools but were more around the challenges of doing this kind of thing in an island location where everybody tends to be focused on exporting their services, uh, um, being in competition with each other um, because of the small population. So I wondered whether any of our speakers wanted to talk about how they've managed to get communities together behind these initiatives. Dawn, that might be something particularly for you guys that would be, um, would be useful because you, you talked a lot about cooperation um, being essential for you to get anything done in Tristan, uh, but also perhaps um, any of our speakers actually would be willing to talk about that. I'm um, sorry, could you just repeat the question again? You broke up a little bit. So, sorry about that, Dawn. Some of the um, questions have been about how it is possible to foster um, cooperation in small island communities. There have been some comments around the challenges about everybody, I suppose, being in competition for the same markets and resources. Um, so how do islands get the willingness to work together towards achieving digital connectivity, to, of, towards achieving their goals? Um, and I think you had some really lovely examples about how collectively everybody saw promotion of Tristan as, as a responsibility within within your community, which you might want to talk about. Yes, I mean, on, on Ireland itself, um, we, you know, we, we wouldn't use, we don't have mobile phones or, um, you know, we wouldn't need internet to, to contact one another. You know, they, these, there's just one village, very small. So, um, you know, it's quite simple to visit people's houses. So, for us to function as an island, it's, we can do it without, um, you know, internet and that sort of thing. But for us to put Tristan out there and um, for us to get Tristan out there and, um, you know, no, notify people that we are here, we need good internet, you know, good means of getting... Um, you know, good means of getting communications out here. On island itself, you know, every, it's very community spirited, as I said, so everyone helps one another. Um, you know, it's a lot of hands-on work to get things done, um, but you know, it, it, it's, it's very achievable. 
Thanks, Dawn. David, I wonder whether you would like to speak about this a little bit. Um, I'm using my own knowledge of Bright Shetland contract now, but uh, obviously this is a contract that is part of the Shetland Partnership Plan, which is a collaborative effort uh, across all of Shetland, and digital is one of the, the key growth areas within that strategy. So I wonder whether you want to talk about how island uh, organisations are coming together to deliver this kind of ambition through digital. Yeah, well, at this stage, we're kind of at the very beginnings of a new way of doing things here. We've got lots of different bodies, and it's very different to, to Jersey because we don't have control over all the different utilities and so on. We've just got different bodies doing different things, and they've all got roughly the same kind of um, aspirations to, to make the economy as good and as successful as it can be, but they've all got their own unique, uh, like specific targets and so on. So for the first time, we're trying to pull together with the Shetland Community Partnership to try and get everybody um, aligned to, to do um, stuff together to try and just make, uh, make it more achievable to, to have more people living uh, kind of successfully in Shetland for far into the future. Um, there is some challenges around it. Uh, we have lots of good meetings and then lots of good discussions. And then people go back to the day-to-day -day jobs and sometimes it's difficult to get everybody to um, do the actions that were, were agreed upon because everybody is busy, we've got things to do. But uh, overall, it's a really interesting new approach to doing things and I think it's bearing fruit. There's certainly lots of um, positive signs of initiatives and I mean, Promote Shetland is one example of that. We feed into this whole thing and we've got... Uh, the kind of public facing role here but it taps into this bigger collaboration and i think i think it's going to be good we need to yeah we need to make sure it it works but um, i think it will yes it's a really interesting point you just made there because we just had the meeting on friday where we may in the room so we managed to get the chief exec of jersey electric company, the chief exec of Jersey Telecom, chief exec of the States of Jersey. And we came to the end of the meeting because I'd been in lots of these meetings where, as I said, everyone agrees it's a nice thing to do, et cetera, but they don't do it. So we created those, you know, an Ike matrix. Do you know what an Ike matrix is? You know, the sort of important, urgent thing, the critical path work, work packages stuff. And that's where we came up with those three things I showed you earlier. So we've actually got three work packages that have come out of that where we said, okay, Jersey Electric is going to lead on the mobility one. So not the government, the electric company, because the enlightened self-interest for the electric company is they want to have more electric vehicles on the, on the island, because obviously you know, there's 130,000 cars on the island and 100,000 people. I mean, work that one out. That's just absolutely crazy. So, and then we've got another organization is going to lead the mobility piece. Sorry, my organization is going to read the circular economy piece. So you have to get people to start thinking horizontally across the island and not just about what they do. So it's not just about transport or it's not just about government and policy. You got to think horizontally and that kind of starts to work. We actually managed to get those chief execs to put their hands in their pockets and come up with 30K each to get us kicked off on doing something around the mobility piece. So it's massively important to bring public sector and citizens and government and policy together. But I mean, there are a number of islands that are on this piece here who actually control things like governance and policy. If you can control governance and policy, start looking at things like uh, data exchanges. Your ability to create the policies around data exchanges could lead to your island being a place where people will build data exchanges because of the laws and the policies and the governance that you put in place. I mean, we've got too many, sorry, too many, but this is all kind of UK focused, but I mean, there are a number of islands there that can do this kind of stuff. If you've got the ability to create policy, create governance, you can start thinking in terms of creating that, that will actually have that foreign direct investment, not in terms of sort of physical infrastructure, but in terms of intellectual property. I think that um, something that's been thinking about a little bit here is that I think creating policy um, to support initiatives um, 
in on the scale of 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 Jersey, to some extent, it's it's similar to Adrian in Aaron Moore. Uh, ultimately, it needs um, strong will and strong drive to make the community, whatever you're trying to do, a success. And I think if you have that at its core, um, and you're able to attract uh, people, or you have people there that you can tap into, who are who are probably have you know islands are great at um, uh, attracting different types of people to them. Um, and if you can leverage different skill sets and find the people that can actually take something and believe passionately about it, that I, I find personally that they're the people that you're actually going to get more change out of um, and, and be able to take some of these initiatives forward. Because I think that, yeah, everyone's been in those meetings where you kind of sit down and actually nobody does anything out of it. But usually there's a couple of people involved in those meetings that actually are pushing an agenda or driving things forward because they feel most passionately about it. So building on people's strengths and people's desire, say, yes, this is something I believe in. This is something I want to take forward. Um, you know, putting the right people and empowering them will actually enable um, uh, more change to happen faster to be able to, su to support uh, communities um, kind of working, working better together and, and like herding the cats instead of just letting things drift. Yeah. I'd agree with that as well, but also, I mean, I, I mean, places like where you are, you can actually, you can leverage things like the catapults. So there's a high performance catapult, there's a satellite catapult, there's a connected places and transport catapult, there's a biomedical catapult. One of the things these guys do, these organizations do, is they can bring all this sort of different thinking with all these different people but they actually also have access to monies. I mean, they get 50 million each. So you can bring those people in to act as sort of like trusted brokers. I mean, islands, from what I've seen so far, they may not have a lot of big P politics, but there's a lot of small P politics going on in the place. So for example, on Jersey here, you never mention Guernsey because everybody on Jersey hates Guernsey and vice versa, all that kind of stuff. There's, there's lots of, you know, <laughs> there's lots of Edinburgh and Glasgow type thinking going on between the islands as well and there's the other bit which is I do the sort of top 10 traits of, of successful communities and everyone talks about partnership and collaboration and the rest of it but in fact what makes people work to a large extent is competition so you know you actually you ping that bit between Guernsey and Jersey you ping that bit between one city and another city you, you actually drive that sense of community and us against the world and resilience as much as you do the, the partnership and collaboration. You get things start to happen. So I like competition as much as I like partnership and collaboration. You know, it's, it's us against the world. That's basically the way it works. Thank you very much for that, Joe. Um, one quite interesting question that has come in, which I think might be a good one to uh, to end on, uh, it's just come in, is how as islands can we collaborate towards crafting policies after this summit? So how can islands come together to create ways of working and thinking that will benefit all island communities? Silence. <laughs> I'm trying not to talk all the time, but I mean, basically things like transport mobility, but actually one for, for one for islands, one that actually works for me, that is just a complete and utter no brainer is around circular economy. Because you all had the added expense of things getting shipped in. You've also got the civil resilience bit of, you know, if there's bad weather and no food arrives, what do you do? You, uh, you all need to take packaging out. I mean, where do you put your waste? Is the waste going in the sea or is it going into the landfill? So how are you taking that out of the system? So there's some very good examples of circular economy, which you could look at, which you, you know, could share between islands that I think it's, to me, it's the fastest, quickest, no brainer possible, create a circular economy way of thinking. And a lot of that is behavioral change too as much as it is around, you know, physical infrastructure or, or technology or connectivity. It's just, it's a different way of doing things. So 
circular economy. I, my, the best place in the UK, and this is just the UK, there are people all around the world here, but the best place in the UK, would you believe, is Peterborough. Peterborough has pinned their hat to a circular economy, and they're brilliant at it. They really are. They've created a circular economy platform. I was out in uh, Barcelona at the FIRA when they were doing the sort of smart city of the year. So it was the usual suspects. They had Moscow, Dubai, Shanghai, San Francisco. And the winner was Peterborough. And you can see about 200 people going on Google Maps going, where the bloody hell is Peterborough? <laughs> and it, they did it because they managed to create a special purpose vehicle that sat outside the government, which took outside the election cycle, which made them actually more agile in terms of procurement. And they have created the whole city around circuit being the best circular economy in the country. So to me, number one, circular economy. Okay, well, I think probably that brings us to the end of this session and something for us all to take away and have a think about. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers for uh, their presentations today and for taking time to answer the questions that have come in. Thank you very much to James for facilitating uh, this panel session. Uh, if you have any additional questions as a result of this uh, session, you can find the details of all of our speakers on the Island Innovation website. Um, most of us have put our LinkedIn uh, profile links and various other ways of connecting on there. So do please do get in touch. Uh, uh, and I think that's probably it from us. Uh, unless James, unless you have anything you want to say. No, I've been listening in the background. If there's any final comments from anyone, otherwise we'll we'll end there. But anyone can get in touch with the speakers by contacting me and I can share email addresses as well. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, then. That's thank you very much, Lauren. Great thank stuff. you. Nice case.